Hey students, this is Mr. Moore, and I'm here with your week 10 AP European History Notes. And this week we're going to be focusing on the Scientific Revolution. And that's what really is a label that we're placing on the 1600s of European history. There is another way to say that. That's the 17th century. Remember, those two things mean the same thing. In the end of these notes, we're also going to talk about Eastern Europe. Um, because we need to understand what's happening in Eastern Europe during the 1600s as Western Europe is really diving into this scientific revolution. Uh, Eastern Europe has its own things going on and it has a different flavor, a different taste, a, a definitely a different uh, point of view in Eastern Europe as opposed to Western Europe. And so those are the two things we're going to focus on. And of course, we want to see how past units that we've talked about will kind of melt into this scientific revolution. Obviously, we started off this class with the Renaissance, and that also led to exploration. And then we talked about the Reformation, which kind of took a bite out of the power that the church, the Catholic Church, had in Western Europe, and kind of allowed for a little bit more diversity of ideas and thinking. And as we get into the 1600s, of course, absolute monarchs are starting to become the thing across the continent of Europe. And so those are the things that precede this scientific revolution. And we're trying to see how those things work together. What I'd like to do for just a minute is kind of look at the, the history timeline. And obviously in this class, being an AP European history class, we need to understand what we're focusing on. And although we're not exactly sure when the first human beings were around, we've got lots of scientific evidence uh, of different evolutionary processes. And there's different religions that have different takes on creationism. Um, but what we do know is that sometime around 3,000, you know, 200, 300, it depends on the sources you look at, is when writing was invented. And so if you go back too much before, like, say, 4,000 B.C., you're going to get into prehistoric times where there's a lot of archaeology and, and a lot of guesswork, to be honest, radiocarbon dating and such, um, as far as what was happening with human history much more before 4000 BC. And uh, obviously the zero mark, as we've discussed, on the calendar that we use in the United States, we use uh, the Gregorian calendar, which is obviously based on Christian dates. And even if you take the Christianity out of it and you say BCE before the Common Era, if you're using the zero mark, or you use the Christian dates, just BC before Christ, they're the exact same dates. So whether you have the Christian references to it or not, it's definitely a Christian calendar, as, as should be clear in this class. Now, anything past the zero mark, the birth of Jesus, that would be AD. Anno Domini, year of the Lord, as it might be roughly translated in, uh, into English. Um, or, of course, you could use the terminology CE, as in Common Era. Um, and obviously, the Roman Empire <laughs> existed before the birth of Christ. Um, well, the Roman Republic, I guess we should say, before the birth of Christ, because it was right around the birth of Christ in the days of Caesar Augustus right right after Julius Caesar, where we really get into the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire falls, you know, people talk about uh, when Rome was invaded in 410, or and it lasted a little longer after that, it limped along, but Western Rome fell apart somewhere close to the year 500 AD, which is when we get into the Dark Ages and Middle Ages. And when we start to come out of the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, this medieval times, is when this class is going to start. And if I took a circle and kind of circled this piece of the timeline, that's the only part of, of history that this class is going to cover. Okay, And if we kind of took this circle and we kind of blew it up a little bigger, um, these are the, the years, right? We're, we're starting somewhere in the 1400s, technically 1450, and then moving up through the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, and of course, we're living right now in the year 2020. So just a hair after uh, the year 2000. Um, I would like you to have a label for each of these centuries. And I need you to plug this into your brain and never forget it. 
It's going to be the bread and butter in this class. And this is not the first time I've gone over this. Hopefully this is a review. But if I say the 1400s, I could also say the 15th century. And I mean the same thing. These, these dates that start with 1400s, um, that would be the Renaissance. Now, the Renaissance probably started during the 1300s sometime. But when this class starts in 1450, we're like dead center in the middle of the Renaissance era. So when I say the 1400s, you should think Renaissance, okay? Maybe exploration. So there's, I guess there's different titles we could put on there, but exploration is going to go into the 1500s and 1600s. And even in the 1700s, there's still going to be some explorers out there finishing up the map. So when I say the 1400s, I want your brain to scream Renaissance. Okay. When we get into the 1500s, there are new monarchies that are developing. And, and there is, you know, Magellan is trying to circumnavigate the globe. But if I was to, to just put one word on the 1500s, you should label this the Reformation. That's the 1500s. When we get into the 1600s, again, there's absolute monarchs that are coming about. And there's even the English Civil War and the Peace of Westphalia, which is kind of ending the Reformation. And so I understand that there's a lot of stuff that's happening in the 1600s. But if I was going to put just a, a short label on the 1600s, I would use the, the label scientific revolution. Two words. So we have the Renaissance, the Reformation, the scientific revolution. If we're going to get into the 1700s, uh, which we are next week and week 11, we're going to be dealing with the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment, uh, it's kind of an evolutionary process of social change from this rebirth of the classics to this challenging of church authority and kind of breaking away from the past and the dogma of the past into this new age of science. And then taking the scientific methods of the 1600s and applying it to politics and social life, that's the enlightenment. Remember, the United States of America is born on July 4th, 1776, right in the middle of the enlightenment, okay? So when you think 1700s, think enlightenment. When you think of the 1800s, think industrial revolution. Two words, but a very short label to kind of see the progression of this class and the different eras that we're going to be dealing with. Now, of course, there's other things in the 1800s. Some people might say, oh, that's the, the era of Napoleon at the beginning of the 1800s. True, very true. Uh, but if we were to put a label on the entire century, I would put the label Industrial Revolution. If we're going to put a label on the 1900s or 20th century, that, of course, would be the World Wars. Now, we're not exactly sure what label we're going to use for the early 2000s or the first century of the 2000s that we're living in. But I suspect it'll be something like the Information Age or, or the Age of... Um, we might want to call it something like the age of globalization. Uh, those are just possible uh, titles that historians in the future might use for the time period we're living in. So I'm going to repeat this one more time because I think it's that important. The Renaissance, 1400. The Reformation, 1500s. The Scientific Revolution, the 1600s. The Enlightenment, the 1700s. The Industrial Revolution, the 1800s. The World Wars the 1900s, including World War I, World War II, and of course the ultimate Cold War that was World War III that didn't quite happen. If you understand that, then, then what we're going to talk about the rest of today is, is going to make a lot more sense. What I kind of got here is a little timeline, an evolution of science, the natural philosophers as they were sometimes called, from the middle of, of the 1400s all the way up deep into the 1600s. And so you might say, well, Mr. Moore, you're, you just called the 1600s the scientific revolution, but clearly some of these dudes lived during the 1500s and maybe even the 1400s. And that the truth is, yes, that is true. All of these things are, are like uh, uh, something that evolves over time. For instance, we get the printing press back in the 1450s that really changed education. It changed literacy. It changed people's ability to spread ideas quickly. 
So even if there were scientific revolutions that were happening uh, or scientific ideas that were happening before 1450, well, they weren't being spread very fast at all uh, because news didn't travel fast until the printing press really made um, that communication so much quicker. So we've got to kind of start there. And that's really one of the reasons why this class starts in the 1450s. If you go up to like, say the fort, you know, early later in the, in the 1400s, uh, you get people like Da Vinci who are pushing the boundary of human knowledge and, and drawing designs for machines that wouldn't be invented for hundreds of years later. Definitely a man before his time. And of course he really is the true Renaissance man. Good at, at art, good at science, which wasn't called science back then, but he was pushing the boundary of, of, uh, of the human body and, and, and how it functioned and work. worked because then he would use that in his paintings and sculptures and, and things like that. So in some ways, he might be one of the original natural philosophers or scientists. You get um, other people like um, Deterius Erasmus, who was kind of pushing, uh, using logic and reason to challenge things that he saw in the church. And of course, later on, Martin Luther is going to jump on that. Um, some people might, they kind of say that uh, Erasmus laid the egg that Martin Luther uh, hatched. It's kind of just a way to say that he kind of set the stage and, and that he was a, a faithful Catholic and didn't go against the church. But then again, Martin Luther didn't start out going against the church either. He just wanted to fix it, right? That's why we call it the Reformation. And then you get people who, once, once people start to challenge the church and how the church saw the universe and its place and its role in the universe other people started to challenge things that the church taught like for instance the catholic church taught that the earth was the center of the universe and that the sun and everything revolved around the earth and nicholas copernicus challenged that and he said no it, it, it's not it's not the earth that's the center which is weird because if you go stand outside and you just stand there on a sunny day and you don't move, you just stand in one place and you stand there long enough, it will be obvious that you have not moved, but the sun has. Now, obviously having a little bit of scientific background and knowledge, you're like, oh, Mr. Moore, it's not, it's not the sun moving, it's the earth rotating. But you gotta remember these guys are back here in the uh, you know 1500s. And so they're seeing things differently. But uh, this Nicholas Copernicus guy, uh, he was saying, hey, I got some, you know, I, I got this theory that goes against all of the church teachings. And he wasn't necessarily trying to change uh, ideas about man's salvation or, or trying to correct doctrinal, you know, like scriptural problems like Luther was, but he was challenging the church. And so Nicholas Copernicus comes up with this heliocentric model saying that the sun is the center. And then you get into people like Francis Bacon that we're going to talk about, right? Okay, knowledge is power. And he's going to kind of help develop this process that we call the scientific revolution, or sorry, the scientific method today, right? That's one of the key components of the scientific revolution. You get Galileo, who uses Copernicus's model and then backs it up with actual observation, okay? And he proves it mathematically. So he starts to take these ideas even a step further. Then you get William Harvey, who starts pushing the boundaries of how human anatomy works and starts really breaking away from the old superstition of the medieval times. Uh, because in medieval times, um, doctors would do bloodletting, you know, trying to drain the evil spirits out of people's bodies. And uh, they were convinced that if you were sick, there were evil spirits inside you that were causing that. And then we're going to get into the real logical age with Descartes, right? And kind of pushing the boundary of what is rationalism and, and how can we use logic to solve problems. And then we start to get into even like um, maybe in a primitive way, even early computers, like having machines that could help do calculations, Pascal. And then we get into the maybe the daddy of all scientific thinkers at the time, Sir Isaac Newton, right? Uh, Mathematica Principas and uh, Principa Mathematica, the book that he wrote on, and I guess kind of paved the way for calculus and, uh, you know, really studied the laws of gravity. And so you kind of see uh, in general how it's not just the 1600s, duh. But by the time we get to the 1600s, we really start to get into 
what people start to recognize is a brand new era of knowledge and learning where we're not dwelling on the superstitions of the past. And so we're calling the 1600s the scientific revolution. And if we wanted to pin it on one person that kind of, you know, really busted it all, um, just before the 1600s was Nicholas Copernicus, the Renaissance era mathematician and astronomer from Poland, who formulated the heliocentric theory of the universe. And this was the first time where we started to replace the old Greek model that Ptolemy came up with. Remember, there was an old Greek, um, I guess we might want to call him a Greek scientist, but uh, maybe a Greek philosopher, um, because it wasn't based on science, not science like we think it today, where you have to do studying and you come up with a hypothesis and then you try to challenge that, right? That's the scientific method that's going to be born from Francis Bacon and, and maybe even a little bit of, of René Descartes. Um, but um, Ptolemy was a, a guy who wrote a lot of stuff back in the golden age of Greece. This is like BC time, okay? Way before this class. And during medieval times, people studied uh, the Ptolemaic system. Um, and, and they thought that the earth was the center of everything. They had this whole system. And of course, Aristotle, uh, they also used Aristotle's model of the universe. Um, so we kind of get a combination of, of Greek ideas being laid out as facts. And what these scientific thinkers are going to do is they're going to challenge the ideas of the past. And they called themselves natural philosophers. We call them scientists today. And um, after Copernicus, I guess the next guy we probably should talk about is Kepler, a German mathematician, astronomer, and astrologer who applied new scientific learning to the theories of Copernicus. And he is best known for the laws of planetary motion. And he actually studied like the patterns, the elliptical patterns that um, – the planets were taking around the sun and drawing on the work that Copernicus had done before. And you're going to see that a lot of these guys will build off each other, which reminds us that no single person uh, is, has all knowledge or has a monopoly on all knowledge. Um, all great thinkers build on each other. Obviously, Galileo comes uh, right about the same time. You can see these guys are living at about the same time. Galileo might be uh, more familiar to you in your brain. Um, Galileo Galilei is uh, an Italian polymath. And remember, if we use the word polymath, that means a person who is really smart in a lot of different fields. And he's known for his work in astronomy. Again, a lot of these guys were really interested in the heavens, you know, um, trying to observe star patterns, uh, lunar cycles. Um, that was something that a lot of these old natural philosophers or scientific thinkers were into. But he was a physicist in a ways, and he was an engineer, a, a mathematician, and he designed um, what some people think is the first real telescope. Now, he actually stole his ideas from a Dutch guy who was using it for uh, military purposes on warships. So they were using, um, you know, these, you've seen in old movies, probably, you know, the captain gets up there and he has uh, what looks like a telescope, but, you know, trying to get like a, a single binocular, if you will, right? Uh, trying to get a look at ships off in the distance. And uh, Galileo, though, took that design, improved on it, and then pointed it towards the stars, right? And pointed it towards the moon and started to find moons around other planets and just did some fascinating work. And then... He used those observations and, and mathematic principles uh, to prove Copernicus was right. Copernicus knew he was right, but lacked the proof. And Galileo kind of closed that gap. And Galileo got in trouble with the church and was under house arrest for a long time. Um, you can kind of see this is right during this Reformation time period, um, you know, but bleeding into the scientific revolution. And you can kind of see a crossover of so many people challenging church doctrine uh, because the church was saying that, you know, God made the earth and it was the center of his creation. And therefore, the sun has to go around the earth. And Galileo said, nope, I've got the proof that you're not right. And so he got into trouble for that. Um, again, you can see a lot of these guys overlapping each other. OK, and so they're they're kind of growing up at that same time. And they're bouncing ideas off each other. And they're also 
getting information on the printing press, right? Uh, so if somebody discovers something, say um, Kepler, you know, is this a German astronomer and, and Galileo's in Italy, you know, and, and, and uh, you get different people in different parts of Europe who are spreading these ideas around. But Descartes was a French philosopher and a mathematician, a scientist, and he was all about rationalism. And rationalism is this idea of deductive reasoning. That is top down logic. Okay. It's and, and prediction. And in a few minutes, I'll show you a little diagram where we look at deductive logic or deductive reasoning as opposed to inductive, which is from the bottom up. This is top down kind of logic um, where you're trying to predict things. When I think of deductive reasoning, I think of Descartes. Think of the D Descartes, deductive. Descartes, deductive. Okay. Galileo, he's famous for the telescope. Kepler is famous for planetary motion. And of course, um, Copernicus coming up with the original idea of the heliocentric theory. And so I'm going to try to get you to remember just a couple things about these guys. Now, the other dude is Francis Bacon. And again, every time I think of his name, I get hungry. I don't know why. Um, you look at the dates right here, and they're, they're definitely overlapping, right? They're definitely overlapping, all these guys. And you can see that they're kind of growing up in the 1500s during this Reformation era. And then they're, they're, they're kind of bleeding into their own era, this scientific revolution. So again, there's, there's always this overlap of the eras, okay? Uh, but he was an English philosopher. So now we got German, Italian, French, English, right? Um, so it's, it's kind of these ideas are bouncing all around, and I, I really do think it's because of the speed at which uh, things could be uh, distributed because of the printing press. But he was a statesman. Uh, he was a scientist, and he helped bring about the scientific method. So when I think of Francis Bacon, I think of the scientific method and inductive reasoning or empiricism. That's bottom up, that's observation, that's experimentation. Whereas uh, Rene Descartes would be the opposite where he's got this idea and he's trying to uh, fit it into the model he already has set up. It kind of turns out that if you blend both deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning together, that's kind of a blending is what makes the scientific method that we use today, okay? And again, I have a little chart that I'll kind of show you. It might help you uh, understand deductive reasoning versus inductive reasoning. But the simplest terminology is deductive is top down, whereas inductive is bottom up. You're starting with just observation with no, no pretense, no theory. You're just observing things and then trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Whereas Descartes is saying, um, you've got this, um, I, I don't want to use the word hypothesis because hypothesis is going to be blended together with both of these, but you're de you definitely have a prediction at the beginning. And then you're trying to see if you can observe things that prove that prediction to be true, top down or bottom up. Sir Isaac Newton might be one of the smartest guys to ever live. And of course, uh, centuries later, there have been some people who have disproved some of uh, Newton's laws, but they were like the bedrock of science for several centuries. And without Newton, we wouldn't have the world that we live in today. So even though maybe some people disproved some of his stuff, I am sure that people in the future are going to disprove some of our smartest guys today and say, yeah, those guys, were they, they, were, they had some things, but they, they were also off a, a, little, a little bit. So Sir Isaac Newton is an English mathematician, astronomer, and physicist who wrote about gravity, how and why it works. He stated that the universe has laws, so it's not magic. And um, he's not denying God, but he's also saying there are rules to the universe, and nothing happens without following rules. So there's nothing magical or mystical. If it looks magical or mystical, there's a scientific reasoning behind it. And if you think about the world we live in today, Newton was hitting on something pretty solid that we still follow today. He kind of invented calculus in a way, and, and one of his most famous uh, writings was Principa Mathematica. Um, 
and and but but still even though he was uh, one of the greatest scientific thinkers he still held on to some old superstitions just like a lot of us do i mean think i think even in the modern world even though we live in the age of computers and space flight and airplanes and you know the internet uh, we still have some superstitions that we hold on to so i'm not judging this guy too harshly but he believed in things like alchemy uh, alchemy is is the idea that you could uh, if you got the right chemical combination, then you could create anything. And so a lot of alchemists were always trying to blend the right chemicals together to create gold. Because if you make gold, then you could just make your own money, right? Great, some great video clips. This one's on Galileo's telescope and then even some modern um things like the Hubble telescope, right? And we're, we're inventing even new ones right now. I've been watching in the news how there's um, a university in Arizona that's putting together this kick butt uh, you know, telescope to, to peer even further into the universe than the Hubble telescope. Um, the sad and sickening thing about these the 1600s particularly is on one hand, we got we're getting away from superstition and we're getting into science. But at the exact same time, it's almost completely ironic that this is like the height of the witch hunts. And I wish I was lying, but it's disgusting and disturbing as you can kind of see in this um, painting or you know drawing from the time. Um, witches, superstition versus science. And if you've ever heard of the witch hunts, it's absolutely horrific where they would take people who were being accused of witchcraft and they would put them on trial. And if you were ever accused of witchcraft, you were almost certainly dead. And there was thousands, tens of thousands of people who were killed. I shouldn't say people, I should say women. Unfortunately, it was very misogynistic. If you've ever heard the word misogyny, that's a word for um, treating women as uh, the second sex or the lower sex or less uh, of a person than a man. And that was an idea. And women know this because it's been just about 100 years in the United States since women got the right to vote. And we have not had a woman president yet as of 2020 when I'm recording this. So more than 45,000 people were killed in these witch hunts. Most of them were women. Uh, they got the brunt of it. Um, even some of the witch hunt ideas spread to the European colonies in the New World. Like you're probably familiar with the witch hunts in Salem, right? Uh, Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, so even in colonial America, there was witch hunts. And you've probably seen that in movies or read about it in your language arts class, or you've heard folklore about those witch hunts that happened. I wish that were just stories. They're true. And it's pretty horrific. Um, in many places, even today, there are still folk traditions that persist. And so even though we, it's easy to look at these guys and say, you guys are so stupid. There's no such thing as witches. But still, there's people that believe in superstitious ideas and, and um, you know, magical powers out there. Uh, and, and still sometimes people can go on witch hunts in a little different way, even in our modern times where people are accused and don't get a fair trial. What do I mean by a fair trial? Well, if you've ever seen Money Python and the Holy Grail, you know, if you can click on this and watch, it's pretty funny where they tried to prove that one of the people in the village is a witch. Um, but this is a picture of Colcom Castle. This is a castle I went and visited when I was in Germany. I took my family there. And we were going on this tour, and the entire tour was in German, so I didn't catch a whole bunch. But the, the tour guide would stop sometimes and explain things in English. And we stopped next to this one really high tower, and uh, I was could tell everybody was totally fascinated like by this tower. And so when she was done explaining everything in German, we asked her you know, if she could share with us in English what she was talking about. And she said, it's the witch's tower. And so apparently if somebody was accused of being a witch in this town uh, on the Musel Valley, um, they would take them up to this high tower, these women who were accused of being a witch, and they would push them out of the tower. And this was a high tower. And if they fell and hit the ground, then they were innocent. They weren't a witch. But if they were a witch, they knew that they would fly off and then they could prove that they are a witch. Now, if you think, well, wait a minute, Mr. Moore, that's, that's pretty stupid. If you push somebody out of the tower and they fall several stories, they're either going to be dead or broken, but they're innocent. Well, that doesn't help at all, does it? Right. It's kind of like the water trial. That's actually a more famous one where you throw an accused witch into the pond and the water's pure. 
So if the water accepts her, then she's innocent. But when I say the water accepts her, that means she starts to sink in the water. Okay. If she starts to float out of the water, that means she's evil because the water is rejecting her. So people are like, well, you're screwed either way, right? I mean, you're going to either drown or you're going to be burned. Once you're accused, that's the problem, right? They're not using logic and reason. So this is the exact opposite of the scientific revolution, the witch trials and the witch hunts during the 17th century. Remember when I say 17th century, I mean 1600s. And there was thousands, tens of thousands, mostly women, who were killed in, in these uh, witch hunts. And crazy people were burned to death, hung in trees. Um, usually when we're in class, I show some great videos to kind of, you know, bring it to life and, and really help you get into it. As we talked about before, one of the one of the key things that was happening during the scientific revolution is breaking from the old traditions of medieval superstition, where people thought that sickness was caused by evil spirits, okay? Or this might even sound stupid, trolls living inside your stomach. You know, I'm talking about some really weird stuff. Um, but but uh, William Harvey was a guy who kind of paved the path to modern day human anatomy and physiology. Uh, he taught about circulation systems of the body and change the way we see physiology, right? Circulation systems from the old ideas of Gallen and the four humors. So uh, back before the scientific revolution, uh, it was thought that all fluids in the body fit into like four categories, blood, um, phlegm, black bile and yellow bile. And that's literally what they would call it and describe it. And, and William Harvey starts to say, you know, he, here's how it works. You know, the, the heart is, is like a machine that, that, that pumps the blood. And, you know, you start to get this whole idea of how things are working. And um, the old idea of bleeding somebody slowly starts to fade away. I wish it, I wish it cut off like right away. Um, but again, if you were sick and not doing well, they would cut you and, and take some of your blood out. And the more blood they took out, they thought that that was releasing, you know, evil, bad, bad, um, you know, things inside of your body. Um, but of course, you know, if somebody's sick and they're losing all their blood, they're just going to keep getting sicker. Of course, we know that now with more, you know, scientific minds. Okay. Um, this right here is Vasilius, uh, Andres Vasilius, known for his major contributions to the study of human anatomy. So lots of times, like my dad taught uh, science at a community college, and he taught anatomy and physiology, and he had cadavers in his room. That is like actual human bodies. So when you die, you can donate your body to science in modern in the modern world. And then, you know, students in college can cut your body up and learn how the body works. In high school, we cut apart frogs and maybe pigs or, you know, stuff like that. Um, but of course, if you're going to become a doctor, you've got to cut apart bodies when it doesn't matter if you screw up, right? And that's what my dad was doing, kind of more pre-med kind of stuff. Um, he never let me see the uh, cadavers, those bodies in his room. I was just a kid. I really wanted to. And he, he was like, nope, nope, it's going to scar you. And it probably would have scarred me, but I, I never got to see his cadavers. But William Harvey and uh, Vasilius, those are the guys who kind of come up with this physiology and anatomy. And I've kind of highlighted which ones they were uh, focused on. And remember, empiricism is this idea that all knowledge and truth can be found through the senses. Okay, experience and observation. And that's a, that's a huge step away from passing things down through tradition or superstition. If you can't see it, if you can't smell it, if you can't touch it, if you can't, you know, hear it, if you can't find it with one of your senses, then it's not real. And so we're starting to see the early development of machines that can actually calculate and quantify things that before seemed magical. You know, it, it was during... Um, medieval times and Roman times and Greek times and going back to Egyptians, if people saw lightning, right, they thought that the gods were angry. Zeus is angry. But, you know, by the time we get into the 1700s, early 1700s, we get people like Benjamin Franklin who think that it's not the gods who are angry, but maybe it's just electricity that could be harnessed and controlled to a certain extent. It's not until the 1800s where people like Thomas Edison start to, you know, really route it into light and uh, use it, um, you know, for 
uh, movie making and, 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 you know, those kind of things. Uh, so it's all going to be an evolution. By the 1600s, we're not quite into electricity yet. Okay. This is just a quick recap that um, Aristotle, you know, who's living back in the time of, you know, like Ptolemy kind of times, the Greek, the classic Greek times, um, the Aristotle system, um, the old Greek dude, Aristotle, came up with the rules or laws that weren't based on scientific observations. They were just his ideas and things he saw, but they weren't based on scientific calculations. Then these ideas mixed with church dogma and boom, a big mess. That was the science, in quotes, of the Middle Ages. And Aristotle was still regarded as a scientific authority in the 1700s. So when people thought about the smartest dude who ever lived, they thought Aristotle, who lived back in Greek times. And of course, the Renaissance, you know, promoted antiquity. So that was a huge difference, you know. Um, and, and, and lots of Aristotle's ideas were being disproved by Galileo and Copernicus and um, were kind of totally changing the system of the old world to the new one. And um, there were ethical issues, and that's always something that's interesting. Um, just because you can do something, does that mean you should? Like if we could clone people, if we get to the point where science allows us to clone people, if we can clone people, does that mean we should, right? That's where we get into ethics. One thing that I like to kind of tie together, because some people kind of get this confused, um, when I talk about the age of absolutism, I am talking about the 1600s and into the 1700s. And that's the exact same time as the scientific revolution. And I guess the, the part where we connect this together is that absolute monarchs like Louis the 14th, the, the most famous of the absolute monarchs, often established scientific academies. So absolute monarchs supported the sciences. And that's kind of, I guess, maybe a way where we could tie these two things together. Um, there's been that age old debate since science came around, uh, a challenge between religion and science. And I think it's still a debate in our world today. And there's some people who like, I believe in God and I believe that he made Adam and Eve. And there's some people who are like, no, it's definitely evolution. Um, that's not just uh, a concept from the past. It's still an argument that people have today. Okay. I'm not going to spend a ton of time, but if you take Descartes' ideas of deductive, remember D&D, &D, right? Descartes, and deductive reasoning and Bacon and his inductive reasoning. Um, remember, deductive is you start to get information and then you see patterns and then you start to form a, a hypothesis and a theory from your observation. Okay. Whereas inductive is you start with a theory. Okay. And then you form a hypothesis and then you observe and then you get confirmation. And so there are different approaches. Um, to the same thing. Now you kind of combine those two ideas together and you come up with the basic steps for the scientific revolution where you identify a question. You don't know, you ask a question. If you don't ask questions, you don't get answers. And then you start to gather info and you form a hypothesis and you test that hypothesis. You record and analyze the data you get from the test and then you state a conclusion and then you repeat it, right? Now that you've got a conclusion, you kind of go back and see if it identifies the question or, or answers the question. And if, and if it does, or kind of does, then you start the process over again. And that's the modern scientific method that's taken us from, you know, horse drawn wagons to rockets and space exploration, right? In just a few hundred years. So this is, one of the most significant things. Now, if you take those ideas of science and you start to apply them to the real world, like the number one most important thing on the planet Earth for us as human beings is the ability to eat and to feed ourselves. And people used to really be scared of famine and running out of food, which is, I know it's weird for us because in the modern world, we walk into some place like Costco and, and there's food stacked higher than you can see. There's so much. In fact, in the modern world, it's almost like we have the, the opposite problem where we have too much and people are dying of heart attacks and obesity. But we took the scientific methods of the 1600s and by the 1700s, in, in, in especially Britain and the low countries like the Netherlands and Belgium and Luxembourg, the low countries, the Dutch lands, 
uh, we started to see some real scientific ideas put into practice with crop rotation. Um, in Great Britain, they started to enclose um, like land that wasn't being used or, or was being used by the peasants, you know, the serfs, the, the commoners. And they started to create these big, almost industrial type of farms with higher yields. And there was a dude named Jethro Tull who invented this machine uh, called the seed drill that could plant bigger, uh, you know, crops and, and, and get more um, crops planted in a quicker time. And um, we started to get all kinds of like crop rotation, um, the new seed drill that was being invented, fencing in, um, you know, wealthy landowners would buy small farms and, and close them and cut off, you know, so that they were maximizing the land and kind of creating early capitalism in the, in the form of farms to make money. And so this, this uh, scientific revolution is going to turn into an agricultural revolution and it's going to feed more people and that's going to change everything. It's how we can sustain, you know, over 7 billion people on the planet Earth today. Okay, so between the 14th and 18th century in England, the large amount of land that was managed as the commons was enclosed to create private property, so enclosures. And the process of enclosure was therefore the process of creating a labor class uh, section of society that was forced to work because they no longer had direct access to the land for subsistence. And so we start to see like more food, but we also start to see a huge shift in um, some people having all the money and we're starting to see a huge class divide and this is going to lead to revolutions in france in the 1700s and just before that in the united states right it's all about money um so much of the scientific revolution was driven by man's curiosity about the heavens and what lies lies beyond and so i've got some great videos in here um the scientific knowledge and advancements in navigation and cartography remember uh, navigation is how you can, you know, navigate on the oceans, and cartography is map making. And of course, military technology with gunpowder ideas coming from Asia allowed Europeans to establish overseas colonies and empires. And uh, so you can see that uh, we have several topics we've talked about that are kind of all meshing together. The Renaissance is this rebirth of learning, which leads to challenging things like, um, you know, exploration. And then we get challenging things like the church, the Reformation. And when you start challenging the church, well, you can break out and start saying things that are probably true, but the church wouldn't let you say before. That's the scientific revolution. And then we start to get into the age of enlightenment, but I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but you can kind of see how this is all meshing together. These are some of the things that were invented during this, you know, uh, I'm putting quotes up here, scientific revolution, things like the telescope, right? First used for seeing things at great distance, like navigation or military purposes. But then we start to study the stars and the moons and the planet. If you go the opposite direction, it's almost the same thing as a telescope, but the opposite direction, microscope, right? Where you can see very small things and, and see the, the little pieces that make up things that might look solid or, or might look like um, they're just one solid straight piece. And you, I, I don't know if you ever looked like a piece of hair under a microscope or, or anything, a little bug under a microscope. It's just so cool to see that, that in this little spot of, of the world, there could be so much right there. So you get the telescope, the grand view, and the microscope, the little view. And then you're getting things that were first used for entertainment. Gunpowder was used for, you know, fireworks. And now we're starting to use it to blow people up and kill each other. The barometer to measure air pressure. And pretty soon we're going to start to use some of these things to figure out weather patterns. You know, um, imagine being able to predict weather. It's not the gods being angry, but it's just, you know, when there's moisture in the air or when there's, you know, humidity or, or high pressure or, or temperatures, right? Um, we get into things like, uh, um, figuring out weather patterns with the barometer, but also uh, a thermometer, right, where we pay attention to um, temperature. And, of course, the compass is, is helping navigation. Chinese probably came up with the first compass, and Muslims, uh, you know, got it from the Chinese, and then Europeans took it from them. So there's always that uh, drawn together. Uh, you put a couple of fun videos in here about misconceptions, because I think sometimes we think that we live in this 
era of total science, but there's still superstitions that hang around. People still, you know, I mean, you talk to some football players and they'll wear the same socks the whole season and never wash them because, hey, they haven't ever lost with their lucky pair of socks. Really? I don't know. And some people say, no, that's true. There was also social development that was happening during this scientific revolution. Chivalry is, is what we call public humiliation, um, where you put people like in the stocks. Um, you know, if they're, if they do something they shouldn't have, you put them in the stocks. You've probably seen that before where they lock their head in their hands and people can go by and spit on them or throw rotten food on them. Um, so that was kind of a way of tr controlling, um, people in society you know if they didn't do something really bad but you kind of wanted to put them in their place and then there was guilds right left over from medieval times craftsmen um combined for advantages and to protect their trade and they regulated uh the making and selling of goods to maintain high standards but and quality but also to control trade and there are still guilds that exist in the world today like the the actors guild you know and i guess maybe even this is like old school unions maybe in a way or at least the beginnings of it during the 17th century aka the 1600s amsterdam was the commercial center of europe and it's where we see the first stock exchange amsterdam the dutch were known for their business they drained their swamps they used windmills and dams that were called dikes um, and they drained their bogs to make more arable land for farming and that's why windmills are associated with the Dutch countries, the Netherlands, or Holland is another way we say uh, the Netherlands. It's not really the same thing. Holland, there's two Hollands inside the Netherlands. They're like territories or provinces, if you will. And, and of course, there was some de facto like um, um, changes where, and the Netherlands are a tricky place because sometimes the Spanish control it, so they'll call it the Spanish Netherlands, and then Austria would come in or the Holy Roman Empire would come in and control the Dutch areas. And for sometimes they were a republic, um, but some of the political leaders were called the Stadtholders, and these were the political stewards who became the de facto head of states in the Netherlands, okay, the Dutch Republic. Again, just some uh, weird superstitions we still cling on today. The Dutch even formed something called the East India Trading Company. It was a joint stock company, meaning that lots of people invested. And so lots of people were getting rich. And there was a tulip mania that happened. And um, I know it's weird. Like tulips became the most valuable commodity sold and traded in. Um, and it was like a futures market, kind of like the beginning of a stock market that we have in the world today. If you really want to get rich, you've got to start to learn how the stock market works. But it all kind of started in Amsterdam in, with these joint stock companies where lots of people invested their money and then they hoped for a return or they hoped that their company would gain capital. And thus we start to see the beginnings of capitalism. Um, some wealthier merchants were also bankers and they loaned money to landlords and rulers. Uh, as well as to other businessmen. And the Dutch were just their great businessmen. They're still known for that today. The Dutch also found ways to overcome the medieval objection, objections to interest or user, usury. That's one of the things that the Jewish people were kind of known for back in medieval time. They were the money lenders because they didn't have a problem charging interest. Um, in today's world, everybody understands the concept of interest. Um, but it's, it's kind of seen as an evil by some people. Um, if you don't understand credit cards and interest, you will be screwed in life. Uh, you, they'll destroy you. Credit cards can destroy you if you just make the minimum payments. So interest can be good and bad, but, but um, anyways, the Dutch found ways to overcome these objections and, um, and they were not, they were not uh, opposed to making money and, and kind of starting the way to capitalism. Bankers also bought and sold it uh, for a profit, different kinds of coins and, and, uh, this is called arbitrage. Anyways, it's kind of weird, but you can buy and sell money even in the world today. Um, I know it sounds weird to buy money, but you can. If I buy British pounds today, if I get, uh, you know, uh, one pound and it was equal to one dollar, but what if the British pound, uh, what if the British pound went up in its value? And so now I could get like a um, dollar and a half to every pound. So anyways, the value of money changes. Um, if you've ever crossed the border into Mexico, you know. Um, today I crossed the border and it's 18 pesos to the dollar. 
And then I go uh, two months later and it's 20 pesos to the dollar. And I'm like, oh, interesting. Now I'm getting two more pesos for every dollar. So thus the value has changed there. So if you think about it, there is a way to make money there or to lose money. Okay, that's arbitrage. The bankers introduced insurance policies. Interesting, right? Like we think of these, these are modern things. Insurance, um, interest, right? Uh, capitalism, stock markets. And this is all forming around this scientific revolution area, right? And they're starting to print paper money instead of trading in gold, um, where a bank says, hey, if it's an official note from our bank, then you don't have to carry tons of gold. You can just give us the paper uh, and we'll recognize that as legitimate like we use today. Today, we don't even use paper money anymore. It's almost all electric, right? I send money via Venmo. I get my paycheck from Apple Valley High School in electronic payments. It's really powerful uh, today's world. Thus, in the early expansion of trade, uh, we're the beginnings of our financial system. It's kind of like the Dutch golden age. By the 1800s, London is going to replace Amsterdam as the financial capital and the financial center of Europe. Um, but really, um, during the 1600s, it was definitely the Dutch. Now, for a few minutes, um, we're going to take a little bit of time and talk about Eastern Europe, the crossroads of the world. Um, remember, Europe is actually a completely attached to Asia. If we just pause for two seconds right here and look at a map of the world, you can't really tell the difference if I spread this globe out right here. You can't really tell where Europe ends and where Asia begins unless you know some geography. There's a chain of mountains called the Urals from the Arctic Ocean down to the Caspian Sea. And then there's a giant chain of mountains right here from the Black Sea to the Caspian Sea called the Caucasus or the Caucasian Mountains. And then there's a, a water, the Dardanelles and, and the Bosporus Straits and such that connect the Black Sea to the Mediterranean Sea and the Mediterranean through the Straits of Gibraltar to the Atlantic Ocean. So this right here is obviously Europe. Okay, if we come here and up. Um, but if you look at it on a map, there, there's no distinction. So there's this crossroads. Where is it Asia? Where is it Europe? And so for the last few minutes, we're going to talk about Russia. And we're going to talk about something called the Ottoman Empire. And that's what I'm talking about when I say the crossroads of Europe. Okay, what was it like on the eastern edge? Okay, this is a map, of course, of Europe over here, Asia over here, Africa down here. This is the Arabian Peninsula. And the green, both dark and light, is the Ottoman Empire. The dark green is like the, the homeland of the Ottomans. Well, not the homeland, but the, the, their, their base from where they started. Remember that the Ottoman Turks conquered Constantinople in the 1450s. That's right when this class was starting. And they pushed all the way up to Vienna. Vienna is the capital of Austria. Don't get that confused with Venice. That's in Italy. This is Vienna. Several centuries after ni the 1942 Spanish Reconquista. Remember that Muslims, called the Moors, they don't spell their name right, but anyways, the Moors conquered Spain and controlled. So Muslims controlled Spain for several hundred years. And Christians during medieval times tried to reconquer Spain in the name of Christianity. And they did. They reconquered Spain, the Reconquista. Okay, and they pushed the Muslims out of Spain. Um, but all the way, you know, the Muslims were still pushing in. The, uh, the Turks were pushing in and expanding their empire deep into Europe. And there was a huge battle in uh, 1683. I just covered it up, unfortunately, when I moved my mouse around. But in 1683 um, is when they besieged Vienna and were stopped. And, uh, you know, Christians end up kind of pushing, slowly pushing Muslims back out over the next couple centuries until they're, you know, back into Turkey today. In the modern country of Turkey is very Islamic, okay? Um, so what is the Ottoman Empire? The Ottoman Empire is dominated by the religion of Islam. That's what makes it really unique in all of European history because most of Europe is Christian or at least was reconquered in the name of Christianity. So if you travel around Europe, even today, it's almost all Christian churches, either Catholic or Protestant, or if you're in the East, it's, um, you know, the um, Oriental or Orthodox church, Christian church. But if you go into the Middle East, and maybe again we'll rewind, this is the Middle East, right? This is what we would call Iraq, Syria, Jordan, you know, Lebanon, Egypt, 
Saudi Arabia, you know, Iran. This is what we call the Middle East today, and it's very Islamic. There are different types of Muslims, just like there's different types of Christians. There's Sunni Muslim, which make up the majority, and the Shia or Shiite Muslims, which make up the minority. Just like there's a split in Christianity between Protestants and Christ and Catholics, right? Or even Catholics and Orthodox earlier on. Uh, Mehmed II was the guy who conquered Constantinople in 1453, ending the Byzantine Empire. This is going way back, but just reminding you, the Ottoman Empire is going to be a part of this class from 1453, when they conquer the Byzantine Empire, Constantinople, all the way until, I would say, 1918, at the end of World War I, Europeans, especially France and Great Britain, are going to dismantle the Ottoman Empire. So it's going to exist throughout the entirety of our class. And so we got to be familiar with the Ottoman Empire. It's called the Ottoman, uh, the people who ran it were the Ottoman Turks. And they were kind of brutal. So even other Muslims didn't necessarily like the Turks. Um, but they controlled the Middle East for about 500 years. The the Ottoman Turks didn't form their empire in 1453. That's just when they conquered the Byzantine Empire. It depends on how you look at history, but even for 100, 200 years before that, you could see the beginnings of this great Ottoman Empire. But once they conquered the Byzantines, that's when they really became a legitimate European power. Um, and they, again, they're going to exist all the way through World War I. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time, but I think you should understand some key words about Islam. If we talk about the people who follow Islam, they're called Muslims. Those who submit, okay, those who submit to the will of the Lord, right, that is Muslims. They are the followers of Islam. Um, Mecca is a place in Saudi Arabia, the most holy city, where the Kaaba is. And um, to, to the an outside observer, the Kaaba looks like a big giant black box that Muslims, you know, parade around uh, during their, uh, you know, ceremonies during um, the Hajj. Um, but it's actually supposed to be an altar that was built by Abraham, if you're familiar at all with the Old Testament, the Jewish writings, or even in the Christian Bible. There's a dude named Father Abraham. <clears throat> and according to the Quran, which is the um, Islamic holy scriptures, right? Kind of like the Christian Bible, this is the Quran. And um, that's um, the holy writings uh, of Islam. The word Allah is just the word God in Arabic. Arabic is a language, but it's also kind of an ethnicity. Not all Muslims are Arabic, but most Arabics are Muslim. Um, Arabic is more of an ethnicity where uh, Muslim is a religion. But again, a lot of Arabs are Muslims, but there's Arab Christians too. Um, but anyways, the word God in Arabic is Allah, just like the word God in Spanish is Dios, right? It's not like a different name for God. It's just the word God. Muhammad is the most important prophet in a line of prophets, which include Moses and Noah and Abraham and even Jesus. I know this is weird, but even in, in the Quran, which again is the holy writings of Islam, they have a story about a prophet named Jesus who was born of a virgin named Mary. Um, so Muslims think that Jesus was a good guy. They just don't think he was God in the flesh you know, or the Savior. So anyways, there is some crossover that we talked about in past discussions. Um, Sharia is Islamic law. Kind of tells what a Muslim should do and shouldn't do. Um, a mosque is maybe a way to say a Muslim church. Church is for Christians. Um, <clears throat> Buddhists and, and, and Hindus have temples. A synagogue for Jews, a mosque for Muslims, okay? Jihad is a word that's been used and misused a lot in the past. Um, sometimes in the modern media, people will talk about um, if you sacrifice your life in the name of God or the name of Allah, um, then you get a straight ticket to heaven. And so sometimes people will invoke jihad like a holy war. Um, I also think it's not much different than what Christians did during the crusade. I, I think if any Christian looks at the crusade, they would think that it was disturbing and horrific and not good. It's not Christian at all. During the crusade, the Pope, the head of the Christian church in Europe, sent Christians on, on this bloodbath war into the Middle East 
to kill Muslims and said that if they died in the service of God, they would be forgiven. God would forgive them. That's what Christians did during the, um, during the Crusades. And most Christians would say that's not, that's not what Jesus taught. The same thing with jihad. Um, there's lots of Muslims who will say it's, that's not Muslim doesn't, you know, Muslims don't, true Muslims don't try to provoke violence, you know, but there are some twisted people who will, you know, in the name of Christianity, will kill each other like we saw in the Reformation. And there are Muslims who twist the teachings, you know, and can do some horrific things. So we should never like put down a religion just because there's some, you know, people who take religious ideas and twist them. I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions about it, I'd be happy to clear that up. There are the five pillars of Islam, you know, their, their declaration of faith and alms and uh, praying five times a day, fasting during Ramadan, you know, and making a, a pilgrimage to Mecca, the five pillars. A caliph is like the leader or uh, like a caliphate is kind of like a, a Muslim empire or a sultan is a, is a leader. And the Janissaries, those are like the special guards of the Ottoman Empire. And the center of the Ottoman Empire is in present-day Turkey on the Anatolia Peninsula. And of course, this is the peninsula I'm talking about. And again, this is the old Ottoman Empire. Just a different map to kind of show you how big it was for a while. Almost as big as the Roman Empire. So the Ottoman Empire is legit, but it was an Islamic one. And that's a huge issue in modern day Europe, right? Um, people from the Islamic world, either North Africa or the Middle East, who are moving into Europe in huge numbers in, in, in the 2000s. And it's causing a lot of social upheaval. Um, you know, sometimes they're being picked on by um, Christians in Europe who don't want Muslims coming in. And we've seen some of that even in the United States after we had some terrorist attacks. Um, there has been some of that, you know, people not understanding Islam and, and what it is. You know, there's a lot of misunderstanding out there, but that's a modern issue in Europe today, either from North Africa or the Middle East um, going in. So I've got a couple videos on Islam. Um, usually in class, we'll talk about Sharia, um, where, you know, like pork is forbidden, alcohol is forbidden, gambling is forbidden. It's not just the, uh, the Sharia, the Islamic law, it's not just what you shouldn't do, it's also what you should do, like dress and act modestly and live the five pillars. I usually make a joke to uh, my high school students and ask them if they know what the word modesty means. Uh, but usually when I see people walking around uh, Apple Valley House High School campus, I know that they don't know what that word means. But anyways, that's my little joke. Um, but again, uh, Muslim women um, oftentimes will cover themselves up simply to be modest. And that's something that's taught in Sharia. But it's also kind of just like a custom in the Middle East. And not just Muslim women, but even Christian women and Jewish women in the area will also cover themselves up. So it, it is kind of a part of Islam, but it's also kind of just like a cultural tr tradition in the Middle East, right? Um, and so anyways, just spend a couple minutes talking about Arabic and its writings. And the Arabic numbering system is the numbering system we use slightly altered, but um, we do not use Latin numbers. Um, if you remember, um, all the letters we use in our English alphabet are all Latin letters, but we don't use Latin numbers. Uh, you guys hate that when I show like uh, Louis the Fourteenth, people are like, X, I, V, what does that mean? Um, but Arabic numbers are a lot easier to use. And of course, at the beginning of this class, I talked about the Muslim calendar starting at zero, when our Christian calendar that we use in the United States starts at about six, you know, so the year 622 on the Christian calendar is just about the year zero on the Muslim calendar. And I kind of talked about my experience in Morocco and very, very different. So I got some great videos. Wish we had time in class. But the other thing we're going to talk about as we kind of conclude here is Russia. And of course, Russia is one of the biggest places on the planet Earth. It is the biggest country on, on, on the on the planet Earth today. For a while, it was called the Soviet Union, and it was even bigger than Russia is today. So here is a map of the United States overlaid with Russia, and you can just see how big Russia is compared. So we got to talk about Russia for a little while. It is the largest country, and it has the largest supply of nuclear weapons in the world today. The reason I put Alaska on here is interesting because in the 1800s, the United States bought Alaska from Russia. So Alaska was owned by Russia, and we bought it, 
And Alaska is the biggest state by far. It's way bigger than Texas. If you go from the Aleutian Islands down to where Juneau is in Alaska, you would it'd be like going from Georgia to Los Angeles in Alaska. I mean, you can just see how freaking huge it is. So Russia is on the edge of Europe. And I know we're kind of running out of time here, so we'll just kind of brush up on a couple things. We kind of start the, um, the, the important leaders in Russia with Ivan III. He's called Ivan the Great. And he's the first leader when this class started in the 14, you know, barely into the 1500s. Russia was slow to become a major European power because of the Mongols. Uh, the Mongols during the 1300s, like Genghis Khan, was like wreaking havoc across Asia, you know, attacking China and controlling the people that lived in what is going to become Russia. Um, the, the Russians would refer to some of the Mongols as Tatars. There's different groups of Mongols. And Ivan is responsible for breaking Russia free from the Golden Horde. That's what they called the Mongols. And uh, he calls Russia the Third Rome. And in fact, they start, the Russian leaders start to call themselves Caesars. Now, the Russian uh, name for Caesar is Tsar, and that's where we start to call, get the Tsars. It can be spelled with a C or a, a T, just depending on how, what, how we translate it into English. But Ivan IV is sometimes called Ivan the Terrible, and he really was horrible. He was a great military leader and very effective at taking over territory but he was a complete jerk. He killed his own son. And uh, anyways, didn't do it on purpose. I'll tell you that story in just a little bit. Um, but remember, the word czar comes from Caesar. So the, the leaders of Russia saw themselves, after the Byzantine Empire was destroyed by the Ottomans, they kind of saw themselves as the rightful heirs of the Byzantine Empire. So there is a direct connect between the Byzantine Empire and, and Greek Orthodoxy and and the, the Orthodox Christian religion um, into this whole what becomes Russia. And um, they kind of borrow ideas in the Byzantine culture and religious ideas. Probably the greatest ruler that Russia had back in this time was Peter the Great. And he was an absolute monarch. And he was from the Romanov dynasty, so I highlighted that word. That's a name, an important Russian uh, name, uh, the Romanovs. And he transformed Russia by expanding the empire towards Europe. He actually went in disguise and toured around parts of Western Europe and came back to Russia and said, we are way behind. We need to modernize. We need to westernize. We need people to start cutting their beards uh, and looking like uh, you know dignified people instead of these savages. From you know, people are never going to treat us as modern as a modern nation if we look like we're these savages, these barbarians. And so he tried to create a navy, which Russia, which would mean that Russia could project its power around the globe. If you don't know this today, Russia is one of the most powerful countries in the world. Okay, so we're going to go from nothing when Ivan the Ivan the Third is being controlled by the Mongols to breaking away and kind of creating what he thought was a new Rome. I know it's weird, but Russia thought itself as the new Rome. They called themselves Caesars. The leaders did the Czars. That's the Russian word for Caesar. And by the time we get to Peter the Great, he really was making Russia a great military power. The leader who came after Peter the Great that really kind of carried on the legacy of Peter the Great is Catherine the Great. You like how they use these words great, except for poor Ivan the Terrible who killed his own son. Um, but really, she creates this winter palace, and she's going to promote the sciences and especially um, the enlightened philosophers. And maybe that's where we can start to see the connection between Eastern Europe and these absolute monarchs and the scientific revolution. Now, you're looking, this is the 1700s, and you're like, Mr. Moore, the scientific revolution you said was the uh, 1600s. And that's true in Western Europe. Um, here's something that's going to be true of Russia the entire time. Russia is going to be like 100 or more years behind everybody else. Okay, They're just going to be behind. They're going to be backwards. Okay, um, But remember, Ivan the Great is the one who um, helped break free from the Mongols. Peter the Great establishes a navy and westernizes the country. Catherine the Great 
um, continued Peter the Great's legacy and, and made the, the Russian monarchy just spectacular and brought the sciences and enlightenment thinkers. Called herself an absolute despot, you know, like, or an absolute, um, uh, an absolutist, um, enlightened absolutism is what they sometimes would call it. Ivan the Terrible was the only one who didn't get the great by his name. And um, anyways, he uh, struck, so his son was married and his wife was pregnant. And uh, apparently he didn't like what she was wearing. And so he hit her and she miscarried the baby. And the, the, the father of the baby, uh, Ivan the Terrible's son, came in to defend his wife. Uh, and Ivan's mad at him, hits him across the head. He hits his head on the throne, apparently. Uh, there's different versions of the story. But nonetheless, Ivan the Terrible kills off like everybody who should have taken over after him. Um, so again, we're kind of looking at where Russia is. Um, Peter the Great makes a city called St. Petersburg. Isn't that convenient? And he tries to create um, a, a navy base. But in creating this naval base, he gets into conflict with Sweden, and they call it the Great Northern War. He also tries to get some port access to the Black Sea. He's trying to create a navy, so he's trying to uh, get access. But if he's trying to get access to the Black Sea, he's going to come into conflict with the Ottoman Empire. So he's fighting the Ottomans, and he's fighting the Swedes, and he's trying to create uh, this excellent, spectacular uh, military power and navy. Okay? And he has these musketeer regiments, the Strelti. Um, but anyways, this great northern war is really just Russia trying to get access to the sea instead of being a landlocked country. Now, this is where we should pause for a minute because in this class I talk about something called Prussia. And that's totally different than Russia. Prussia, if you want to put this in your notes, Prussia is Germany. And I know I just covered it up because I moved my mouse around. But Prussia equals Germany, whereas Russia is totally different. Okay, so Prussia, the capital was Berlin. Russia, the capital was St. Petersburg or Moscow, depending on the time period. St. Petersburg was made by Peter the Great, and that's when he moved the capital to St. Petersburg. Duh. Uh, but usually it was traditionally Moscow. So again, he's going to come. Russia is going to come into conflict with the Ottoman Empire, trying to get access to the Black Sea, and it's going to come into conflict with Sweden, okay, and, and Scandinavian countries when it's trying to get access to the Baltic Sea. But Prussia and Russia are very different. And if you really want to kind of picture it, Prussia and Austria were what was once called the Holy Roman Empire, okay. And of course, after 1648, the Holy Roman Empire is weakened, and Prussia and Austria start to emerge out of the old Holy Roman Empire. I know that's a lot of stuff to learn, uh, but we had a great uh, talk here about the scientific revolution and also about Eastern uh, Europe. So you got some great crash course videos and other review videos, tons of them. Uh, about the Dutch Golden Age and stot holders and inductive and deductive reasoning and the agricultural revolution. In other words, if there's a topic I talked about that you need further information on, you can come to either the crash course videos or the review videos at the end. It's nice to talk to you guys. During week 11, we'll get into the Enlightenment. Have a great week.